Happy Friday, dissidents. Welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me for our weekly chat on geopolitics and markets and anything else on our nerdy minds is Rob Larity, our chief investment officer. Uh, not a lot of programming notes for me on this one. Just a reminder, or uh, <laughs> not a reminder, informing you that Rob and I are both going on a very rare vacation next week, not together, separately. Um, but we will both be out next week, so we will not do the podcast next week we will pick up with our normal cadence in two fridays otherwise um, we've had a lot of new listeners discover and come listen to the podcast recently welcome we're really glad to have you if you haven't done so already please consider taking five ten seconds out of your day and rate this podcast on whatever app you're listening to it on whether it's apple Podcasts or spotify or wherever else you have found us um, it really does help us, I won't say immeasurably, because we can tangibly measure how much it helps us and helps us go up the ranks of the algorithm, but just takes a couple seconds of your time and it's hugely helpful for us. So if you like this content, you want to keep it ad free, you want to keep it going, please just consider rating it for us. Otherwise, you can always write to me at jacob at cognitive.investments if you want to talk about anything in this podcast, uh, if you want to talk about geopolitics, about investing, about um, a book you read recently, if you want to suggest a podcast guest, if you want to be a podcast guest, you can hit me up on email. Other than that, um, cheers, take care. We'll see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. All right, listeners, we're back. Um, Maybe we'll call this the kitchen sink podcast episode. We're just going to throw a bunch of uh, a bagatelle of things that have been on our mind and markets at you because we have no one singular secret of the universe to distill into your ears. Uh, Rob is with us as usual. How's it going, Rob? Uh, doing well, Jacob. Good to be here again. Well, you're about to be doing well. Rob has to fly transatlantic tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, right? Um, no, it's tonight. Oh, it's tonight. 10 p.m. Ooh, geez. Okay, so you're doing well, and then you're going to fly to France, and you won't be well on the flight, but then you'll be in France, and then everything will be great. So, right? Yeah. Well, I was, I was saying to Jacob before that I think there's a special little section of hell reserved where for those people who've done something especially bad, you're for all eternity destined to uh, be on a never-ending transatlantic flight with a baby I wonder in coach. If- I wonder if anybody's ever, somebody must have thought of this already to like do Dante's Inferno, but like update it to the 20th century or 21st century or something like that and create new punishments or circles of hell. Somebody must have done that, right? Because if not, maybe I'll, maybe with all my free time, I'll do a little satirical 21st century Inferno. Um, Anyway, we're, wow, are we off to a good focus start, guys. So let's, um, let's talk about a couple things. Um, First, uh, Rob, why don't you just kind of give us a sense of where markets are at right now up to this year? Because it's been a crazy year. It's been a crazy time to start a podcast about geopolitics and markets just because it feels like even more so than usual every week is some new narrative or the sky is falling or we're back on the rally. Um, so why don't we just ground ourselves a little bit with, OK, here's what here's what's happened the last six months. Here's kind of what we're looking at going into what will hopefully be a calmer summer. Um, sum up the last six months for us. Sure. So it's been a six months of pain in short for almost everything. Um, year to date, the main stock index in the United States, the S&P 500 index is down as of right now about 20%, which is a pretty significant drop. And most stocks, you know, that's year to date. Uh, the S&P peaked right at the end of last year, but most stocks have been going down for much longer than that. So really, if you were to throw a dart at the stock market and pick a stock at random, it started going down last February. So February of 2021. Mm -hmm. So it's been really an 18 month period of just endless uh, drawdown and decline and suffering. Um, At the same time, you know, for those who who aren't familiar with how these things are usually set up, most financial advisors 
uh, build you portfolios that have stocks and bonds in them. And the idea is that when stocks go down, bonds tend to do better and go up. So it buffers your portfolio. Um, the problem is that that has not happened uh, this year. Um, bonds, the aggregate bond index is down 11%. So stocks are down 20% this year, 2022. Bonds are down 11%. Um, so this is essentially a, a worst, uh, worst case scenario for people who are in that traditional, uh, usually, you know, they call it the 60-40 portfolio, 60% 60 stocks, 40% bonds. It's, you know, the easiest thing you can do and call it a day. Uh, and that's been a disaster. That's that portfolio is down 16% year to date. And that's supposed to be a pretty conservative uh, portfolio for clients. So if you're looking around and, you know, you're seeing a lot of confusion, a lot of worry on people's faces, that's the reason because a lot of people um, own significant portions of bonds in their portfolio. And they're used to that providing certain protection and it's not doing it this year. So that's sort of the, the setup so far. And behind these headline stock indexes, which tend to be bigger and more lumbering than the more speculative stocks in the market, the, the speculative areas have been absolutely crushed. So just for example, just to give some context around the scale of what we've, what we've experienced in the last two years. So uh, Zoom, which everyone uses every day now, if you were to have a crystal ball and see that COVID was going to happen and it say it was summer of 2019 and you could see everything that was going to happen and you knew that Zoom was going to become a household name. So you could have gone out then and bought Zoom stock for $90 a share. Um, and at that point, I think, I don't have this in front of me, they were doing something like $500 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to today. What is Zoom stock right now? It's $111. So fast forward th three years in advance, Zoom has gone from being kind of a no-name company to being, you know, the the household name that it is, the Kleenex of video calls. Its revenues have gone from 500 million to uh, over 4,500 or four, four and a half billion, I think it is. So you're talking about almost a 10 times uh, growth in revenues. And the stock price is $110. And it, recently it was, it was $90 until it bounced just recently. So you would have lost money over three years getting that call exactly correct. I mean, you couldn't have, have picked a better business to be exposed to. So that's the kind of uh, environment that we're dealing with. And the issue is that the valuations of companies have just become so compressed relative to where they were during the heady times of late 2020. So that's the environment we're in now. And the big question on everyone's minds is, how long does this last? Um, you know, how long do we remain mired in a bear market? Do you get a rally? Um, what happens if the U.S. goes into a full-on recession? Uh, those sorts of things. So that's the market background in a nutshell. Okay. Let me play a little devil's advocate. Let's imagine I'm uh, you're stuck in the middle seat and I'm on the other side and I won't shut up while you're trying to, to, to get some sleep. Um, the first is that, well, I, and I, this is not the devil's advocate part. I just want to hack into why bonds haven't done so well. I think I know the answer to this question. I would think that it has to do with the fact that we've had these abnormally low interest rates for so long and that you had this 60-40 port formula, uh, port formula, portfolio formula where people just throw you into the 60-40 even when interest rates are at super historical lows, which meant that whenever interest rates were eventually going to go up and that was going to happen at some point, anybody who bought bonds during that time period was going to get screwed. Um, so it, it seems to me that it, in some ways it's a, it's a symptom of those low interest rates and that as we get back maybe into, more, into a more normalized interest rate environment, suddenly you can use bonds again. And the, the second half of that question is um, whether, sorry, my phone just started ringing. Um, the, the second half of that question, though, is um, whether 
and I've seen this narrative out there a lot, that consumer defensive and staples have sort of taken the place of bonds. Because it seems to me that the one place you could hide in the market for the last year are boring companies like General Mills or Colgate or Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Like th Those are the ones where you're going to get a lot of variation over the last 12 months, but you're not going to be down 20% sort of based on a year ago or maybe even 18 months ago. So talk to me a little bit about what you think the future of bonds looks like in a rising interest rate environment or whether I'm wrong about the – take that question wherever you want it. Yeah, sure. So there's a few different issues in there. The first one is about – you know, your, your comment on interest rates being very low. And the issue here more broadly is the idea of passive versus active. And um, the problem here with bonds was that the underlying assumption of most financial advisors is that you cannot make any call on how much risk there is in the market. So um, put another way, you, you can never know the market's just completely random. You can never have any idea of where it's going to go or if it could go up or down from here or how likely it is to go up or down. And if you really explain that to an individual person in, in plain English, I mean, they see immediately it's nonsense because, I mean, anyone, I mean, we were calling, calling this out. Everyone was calling this out. This isn't us just patting ourselves on the back. But well, you could have looked around in late 2020 and seen what was going on with the meme stock mania and, um, you know, what was happening with VC and everything getting funded and everything growing to the moon and uh, hold on for dear life. And you could see that that was not sustainable. And that doesn't require um, some amazing insight. It just requires analysis and the guts to make the decision that you don't want to get involved. And, and likewise, you know, in the bond market, the same thing is at play. So when interest rates are super, super low for a very long time, you have to sort of do the analysis to understand what the risks are. And um, it's funny because I explained I met someone uh, at the office the other day and he asked what we do and I explained, you know, our approach to markets and how we're active and we try to do what I just described. And he said, well, you know, isn't that market timing? Um, and he, he said that like it was like we were, you know, uh, 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 some kind of weird scummy people like market timing. <laughs> um and, and it's really funny to see how the perception of that has, has been ingrained in people. And I think he got it when I described it as, you know, market timing is saying, hey, the market's going to do X, Y, Z tomorrow, which is really hard to know. That's like noise. But really what we do and what active means is saying, okay, it's, it's July right now. In October, there's a very high likelihood it's going to be colder. So you want to go out and buy some coats, you know, I mean, that's sort of the longer term probabilistic way of thinking that truly active investors do. And somehow that's been squeezed out and, 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 and this perception has been created that that's um, impossible somehow. And, and that's really silly. So, so that's the first issue on what you said. The second issue was really, uh, ties more into geopolitics, I think, because bonds, um, you know, we've come out and said that we don't think inflation is going to remain high and sustained for a very long time. This is not the 1970s. This is like the 1940s, um, which we've said over and over. Um, in that environment, the, and, and in a geopolitical environment where there's a lot of volatility, which is, I, th I think, our underlying assumption for the next 20 years. And you had the wonderful interview um, with, your, uh, with your friend from Strategy and Future yesterday, where at the end of the interview, he laid out, you know, buckle up because it's going, I mean, it was very scary. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that, that that is correct. And if that is indeed the case, and I think it probably is, then you're going to have these experiences like we're having now where bond yields 
go up 200 basis points or, or 2%, you know, mortgages go from 2% to 6% and then they go back to 3%. Um, so if you're dealing with volatility, you're dealing with asset prices all over the place and in the end not trending in any particular direction, then you need to have the wherewithal to, uh, to buy when they're, you know, getting clobbered and to sell when they're, you know, when the trumpets are sounding and everyone's giving the all clear sign. Um, so that's, I think, a fundamental problem with the way that a lot of uh, investors are set up right now, because right now it's set it and forget it. Well, and I, I feel like the passive active discussion is, is one of those things where something that is true got twisted and simplified into something that wasn't true anymore. Because I think the reason that that passive became sexy, at least psychologically, was because most people, when there's fear or when there's blood in the streets, they're pulling money out. They get scared and they start reacting and they, they just I, they clutch their pearls and I'm going to put it under my mattress and that's going to be it. And it is true that if you if you do that or if you're even let, let's say you're just bad financially and you just take your money out because you want to go build a new pool or something in your backyard, you're not going to grow well. So if that's your comparison, yeah, leave it in the market like over time, the market will iron itself out and you'll be OK. Whereas that, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way. It's probably just the way that if you're not somebody who has the stomach to be in the ring in markets all the time and to say, no, I'm going to make these decisions. I'm going to take some licks, but I'm going to have more successes than I am failures. And I'm going to be engaged in the market constantly. And I think that might be the source of some of, of the passive active um, fight. Do you, do you think that's accurate or do you think there's something else going on there? Yeah, I think that's definitely accurate. And that, that is one of the main functions of a financial advisor is basically to keep you from doing things that are stupid which is what you described, you know, the market's just crashed, let's freak out and sell everything because I can't take the pain anymore. Um, but staying and doing nothing is a very different proposition from being active and, or I should say proactive and, and taking advantage of those opportunities. And that's easier said than done. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time with the psychology research and behavioral finance, and in many ways, that's the genesis of the name, cognitive investments. Um, and it's funny because the research shows, even if you know what I'm saying right now, and everyone kind of does, we're very poor at anticipating how we're going to react under different environments. Like I can tell you right now, hey, when the market's crashing, you want to step in and buy it. And when the market is, you know, meme stock mania, you want to you want to sell to those guys. That's very different than actually doing it because your gut has a mind of its own, literally. Um, and having the analytical rigor and the training and the self discipline and the organization to act appropriately is a whole nother ball game from just, you know, lip service. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so that's kind of the last six months, I guess. I guess the the other thing we haven't really touched on, and maybe the segues into some of the other things in our in our grab bag or in our Mary Poppins bag that we have here is is commodities. Um, and commodities feels like a weird thing to me in some in some way because you've got this narrative that's built of a commodity super cycle and that everything is just going to go up and there's not enough supply and the market for commodities really has been doing this weird thing where it's almost like um, it's almost like a relay race and each commodity is handing the baton off to the next commodity. So lumber prices spike and then it hands off to uranium and uranium spikes and that hands off to oil and then oil spikes and they all like eventually come back down and we're just kind of, you know, going on the musical circle of, of chairs of, of these different commodities and things like that. Um, I know you've been thinking about coffee recently and I've been thinking a lot about natural gas, but before we dive into some of those specifics, um, how do you think about commodities relative to this market that we're talking about? Because there also is a sentiment out there, I think, that you know commodities have overperformed here and that they're really just in the beginning phases and that you're going to get another leg up. And I can I can see that argument and it makes, it makes sense with a lot of the um, globalization recession and geopolitical competition things that we talk about here a lot. But w work the commodities into that that market picture you just painted. There's always a, an inclination to call something a super cycle and to look for some super cycle somewhere. 
which is a really nice sounding term. Um, I mean, it's very tempting to use that. And, you know, we've just come off a period where there was always a bull market somewhere, a big bull market, whether it was the 90s tech mania, and then we transitioned into housing, which turned into a bubble, and then emerging markets and oil and energy, and then big tech stocks. You know, there was just mania after mania after mania. And the kind of ugly reality is that that's pretty unusual. Um, and that's not usually the case that, that you experience that. And just getting to what we were saying before on the volatility of everything now, I, I think volatility is ugly because it means nothing ever really gets started. Um, and that's hard for people to wrap their heads around because the whole investment industry is, is made to build you products that are telling some huge story that, you know, it's commodity super cycle or it's tech super cycle or it's emerging market super cycle. It's not so well set up to be like, well, you have to be tactical and, and thoughtful because some things are going to go up while other things go down and then this thing's going to go up and then it's going to crash before it goes up anymore. And, um, and that's really the environment that I think we're probably in. Um, you know, energy is, is a good example. Um, agricultural commodities are a good example, and and you've written at length about the underlying, you know, structural factors in favor of food. Um, but it's going to be extremely bumpy along the way. Like three weeks ago, we were on this podcast, and you know, soybean and and corn prices were testing their all time highs. Uh, and remember, I came out and said, well. I think, you know, I'm very bearish on these things. I think you're likely to, to get a big shakeout. And, you know, we talked about um, our friend at Pinecone Macro and what he was hearing and everyone was a fertilizer expert all of a sudden. <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of what we've seen. You know, both of those have gotten whacked um, in the last just few weeks. So I think that's more the rule than anything else is you're going to have crazy spikes and things, but crazy spikes sort of engender their own end, especially in commodities, mm -hmm. um, where you have elasticity of demand and, and, and you know, supply responses. Um, so, you know, super cycle, I, I think you need a massive uh, source of demand growth to have a super cycle in anything. Usually super cycles don't come because of supply. Supply causes spikes. And that's why the return profile of commodities is very skewed. So like if you think of the normal distribution, like the bell curve, commodities are very weird because they have a very fat tail on the positive side. There's some times when commodity prices just explode. Um, but you don't often get, commodities are naturally a mean reverting asset. So without something like a Chinese infrastructure build out from 2003 to 2011, it's hard to get just kind of sustained bull markets and commodities, at least without massive drawdowns in the, in the middle that are, that make it very difficult for anyone except the hardiest to actually hold on and capture these things. Yeah. Which is the perfect segue though, to kind of where geopolitics enters into this. And I've been thinking a lot about natural gas um, in the last week because you asked me to think about natural gas for some research ideas that we're doing, um, some investment ideas, I should say, that we're researching. That's that's good English. Um, and um, it's it's funny. I was I was reading the the latest market commentary from um, these guys, Goering and Rosenswag. I hope I'm pronouncing that that right. Um, their first quarter uh, 2022 market commentary. And the title of the piece is The Gas Crisis is Coming to America. And it paints a pretty stark picture of this idea that, um, you know, shale is going to peak quicker than people think and that um, the U.S. has sort of been immune from global gas prices. And there's this huge difference between U.S. gas prices and what's going on in the rest of the global market. Um, and, and really calling for this kind of reset as the U.S. reaches peak production, as the U.S. exports more and more. And I, I bring that up because they have a line in there where they, they throw some shade at guys like me. They say, as far as we can tell, most analysts spend their time debating the international geopolitics of gas and they take shale production uh, completely for granted. I want to say not guilty as charged. I try to think about both of these things. Um, but I do think this is one area where geopolitics actually intervenes in a pretty significant way. 
um, because if the United States doesn't want to export gas, uh, it can probably be self-sufficient and it can probably keep natural gas prices low for the U.S. domestic market for a long time. But what we're seeing here in just the last couple months is that the United States is saying, hey, Europe, don't worry, we're going to increase our LNG capacity. We're going to come and help you. Uh, you don't have to be dependent on Russia anymore. You can see the U.S. saying it's going to use natural gas for geopolitical reasons. You can see the EIA publishing these really rosy, optimistic scenarios where um, U.S. shale gas production just keeps increasing stepwise out to 2050, which is probably your biggest sign that it's not going to increase stepwise up to 2050. Um, but it really is a two-part question. It's, yes, there's a thing about shale production, but there's about how is the U.S. going to use natural gas? And I'm, I, I want to tie that back to what you said, which is, you know, the thing about the commodity super cycle is if we are going into an era where markets are going to be less global, then you're going to have these different regions that are going to have to find their own supply and create the entire infrastructure of the supply behind that sort of thing. And that really is a different kind of market. And maybe we're not talking about global oil and global wheat prices anymore. Maybe we really are talking about, no, we're talking about the North American market and it's exporting to these three countries and, and things like that. So that's that's kind of on my mind a, a little bit because I think it dovetails with exactly what you just said. Yeah, I think that's right. Volatility, fragmentation, messiness um, are the, the words that I would describe, you know, the environment we're in now and the environment that we're probably going to, to remain in. Um, uh, I, I read their uh, letters sometimes and they're really well written. I, I, I guess two things sort of contributions I would make just from my own experience because, you know, you, you see these calls made a lot and not just in energy, but in all sorts of sectors where there's narratives out there and, you know, six months ago it was, we're going to run out of copper and in, 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 in a year and, you know, everyone is going to be driving an electric car. And if everyone in China has a, a, a EV car battery, then, you know, we're going to, we're going to have a major crisis. And I think the, the problem is twofold. First, those stories are very seductive. Sometimes they turn out to be, you know, true when you do have spikes, but they're very nice stories to hear. Um, and they tend to take a current trend and extrapolate it into the future, which analytically feels right to us whenever we look at it. You know, you look at a chart and you just want to draw that line up into the right um, cause that's easy. So I, I would just caution against reading analyses like that and, and falling into that mistake. Um, especially with commodities, because, you know, as we said, commodities are a mean reverting asset class. And if you look over 200 years, commodities haven't really done anything, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. Look at corn prices. Um, well, they, they've done something. They've gone down. Yeah, um, that's the, so. So the notion that uh, you're going to have these massive, epic super cycles that last decades, history argues against that in the first place. And and I think part of our trouble in imagining this is that it's really hard to imagine adaptation, because by definition, you don't know what it's going to be. And if you were here in 2006 or 2007 and looking at the oil scenario, and everyone was making similar cases back then, and, and, and oil did spike, but it didn't last that long, who imagined that you know, the Permian Basin was going to be what it was within a short amount of time? No one. And, and I think that's sort of the structural barrier to really wrapping your head around commodities in some ways is... It's really hard to imagine the unknown unknowns in some in some sense. Where the innovation is going to happen, where the where the world or demand is going to flex, or supply is going to flex in a way you didn't expect it. Um, for all we know, you know, uh, Guyana could be some oil supply juggernaut ten years from now that no one ever thought. Of. I'm just totally pulling this out of my butt, frankly, but. That's yeah, the sort I, of thing I, that happens. I think you're pulling it out of Exxon Mobil's butt because they talk that way about what they what they found in Guyana. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean that's yeah. You just always have to be skeptical of stories that seem really exciting because most of the time, 
it's 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 much more stodgy and boring the analysis of these yeah. events. Let, let's focus on that a little bit though what you just said which is volatility, fragmentation, regionalization. Is there a counterfactual? Is there like a reemergence of globalization? And I'm asking because I'm I'm reading I shouldn't say I'm reading when I'm watering my my grass and every morning now I'm listening to Danny Roderick's uh, globalization book on Audible. Um, and he sort of talks about the different phases of globalization, about how there have been different periods of globalization, and that really, in some ways, the 19th century, end of the 19th century, that was the real zenith of globalization. We still, even today, like we don't have the same sort of um, free movement of labor and capital, especially that they had at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. And I wonder if, if you know, if if I'm wrong about this, or if we're wrong about this, one of the ways we could be wrong is that we go back to globalization a little bit. And this is again where natural gas is so interesting because the creation of LNG and the rise of LNG as a real substitute, as a way to make a commodity that was really all about domestic local markets and make it regional and make it global. I mean, that's a fairly significant deal, even in the context of the U.S.-China relationship, which has been getting, re- been getting really hostile and really aggressive lately. China is one of the biggest importers of U.S. LNG in the world. Now, they've fallen off in the last two, three months because of the Russia-Ukraine war. Maybe that's going to change things indefinitely. But they've been importing lots of LNG. And even the Trump administration wanted them to buy more LNG. So you're linking the Chinese and U.S. energy markets. And I... I couldn't help but also think of Japan and the U.S. in the 1940s because Japan needed U.S. oil and it was when the U.S. decided to use oil as a cudgel against Japan that they really empower the hawks in the Chinese, uh, in the Japanese government, excuse me. And that's when Pearl Harbor, the planning for Pearl Harbor begins, all because the U.S. yanks the oil away from China. So there is, I think, an argument here, maybe um, if I'm to, to sort of take the counterfactual that maybe we're not at the globalization recession yet. Maybe LNG is an example of how some markets are going to continue to globalize and you're not going to get that snap back until some kind of major conflict. And then you could really get um, some of the market dynamics that they're talking about, even if it's not the sort of crazy, oh, we're going to run out of natural gas story. You could get the sort of scenario where, hey, if the U.S. is joining a global LNG market, U.S gas prices are going to more resemble the rest of the global market, not the, you know, one eighth discount that they've been for the last couple of years. Is there anything to that? Or do you or do you or do you feel comfortable with uh, where we're at with our globalization take right now? No, I think there is something to that. Um, the LNG and gas market is a good example, because until fairly recently, that was very much not a global market. Um, LNG export capacity in in the U.S. was really only built out in the last decade. Um, And the way that those markets were priced was always much more fragmented, much more based on spot contracts. So even amid kind of this fragmentation background, which we've talked about a lot, you have cases where, as you say, you get a globalizing market. There's things moving in the opposite direction. I think the Danny Roderick point is a really interesting one, and, and ultimately it depends. So think I'm, I'm thinking of examples here. Um, look at uh, look at NIMBYism in the U.S. So in theory, over time you should have more free flowing movement of people and capital and 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 goods, and that's a really striking uh, outlier that even during the period of globalization, you had certain cities, for example, where you didn't see flows of people anymore because you would have um, sort of emerging interest groups that would block building or block, you know, new people coming into neighborhoods or block uh, apartments and and that sort of thing. So, um, and, and similarly, like as Danny Rajak points out in your example, In the 19th century, you know, my ancestors came from Sicily and they just got on the boat and they showed up one day and they were here. Hello, you know, let's get to work. Um, You couldn't do that today because you have legal restrictions and sort of entrenched interests that have built up. Um, So there's certain things pushing in that direction. And then obviously in the other direction, you could cite technology as as a lubricant of global flows. So 
uh, just to stick with the labor issue, if, uh, you know, my uh, great grandfather came from Palermo and showed up on U.S. shores, they put him in a detention camp today. Um, but you could work remotely from Sicily. And now with Zoom, the, the Kleenex of video calling, uh, you know, the tools to do so are suddenly much easier. And there's companies that are emerging to facilitate the paperwork of cross-border labor. And this is all high-end stuff. Um, and and uh, we're working uh, now with a group in Kenya that's, you know, setting up structures to train Kenyans in, uh, in technology uh, services and, and facilitate their cross-border labor. So this is an exciting new area that's happening at the same time that arguably nimbyism and, and other aspects of, you know, flows of people are becoming more clogged. So I hate to say this all the time with every question, but it really depends and it's complicated, I guess. Don't worry. The, the people who listen to this podcast come for the questions we ask and for the commentary. They're looking <laughs> for the the doom and gloom. The world is is falling. There's a lot of other podcasts you can go listen to uh, with much larger followings because, I don't know, I guess that's what people like. Um, let's close out, though, on uh, you had a couple of thoughts on coffee, which I think also connects to this, but also, also shows, I think, how specific commodity markets are and that sometimes it's really not all highfalutin what's going on with the future of markets and the meaning of work and sometimes it's it's a little more brass tack so uh tell the listeners what you were telling me about coffee right before we got on here so coffee is an interesting one um we were long coffee from mid 2020 and and exited that position a few months ago and um i think it's an interesting example now of some of the things we're talking about because uh, the view on coffee, like most other commodities, has been very bullish. And um, the data just came out this week showing that the, the stocks in, in the warehouses, the ICE stocks uh, uh, data, um, so how many bags of coffee are they holding in the, uh, the trading warehouse, in other words, hit a 22-year low. So... Um, that has kept coffee prices buoyed because everyone's worried that we're going to run out of coffee. Um, but it's an interesting background because, so Brazil is having pretty decent weather this year and coffee is on a biennial cycle. So the plants produce a smaller crop in the first year and then a much larger crop in the second year, uh, just because of the, the way the, the, the biology of that works. Um, so we're about to enter into the, the harvest begins uh, in the next few months. And we're, we just experienced a, a small crop year and now we're going into a, a big crop year. And right now coffee markets are trading on, okay, well, until we get to the next crop, is there going to be enough uh, beans in storage? And um, I think this is an interesting case where things you learn, like if you were just a coffee guy and there are just people who just do coffee of course that's your focus and it's an interesting example of being a generalist because we've talked about companies that are building up their inventories building shock absorbers into their business because they can't depend on getting the shipment on time when they need it and then they have nothing to sell to their customers all of that stuff and um, this is something that we've done some work on this week but uh, we have some suspicion that something similar has happened with coffee roasters. So there's no coffee beans in the warehouse, but we suspect that some of these roasters have built up their own inventories, just like, um, just like, you know, Nike, who just reported earnings this week. And if that's true, then the true amount of coffee supply out there is probably significantly more than people expect. And you have this big crop coming and we just um i whatsapped with uh some contacts of ours in brazil in minas gerais which is the heart of coffee country and they're very optimistic about this year's crop everything's great they're they're super bold up weather's good there was a frost that turned out to be uh not too bad in the end but it just goes to show that you know volatility is the name of the game and you have 
you know, the, the natural response of certain players to volatility, in this case, the coffee roasters building up their stocks because they're afraid of not being able to get coffee when they need it, that creates volatility. Because if that's true, the coffee price, which is like $2.20 a pound today, that's going to that's gonna really drop. So you see how you have, you know, the volatility causes people to act in different ways, which then begets more volatility. So it's a very messy, again, there's that word. It's a very messy process, all of this. Yeah. From and, if an we analysis get, and if we get a triple dip La Nina for real, uh, your buddies in Brazil probably aren't going to be texting you about how nice the weather is. They're probably going to be telling you that it feels like a, their, their third trip around uh, in the airplane. They're going to be jumping on the ship yeah. themselves. Um, I think we just keep it short and sweet there. Uh, so Rob and I are both going on a vacation. Imagine that next week. So you will not hear from us next Friday, listeners, but we will be back on our normal cadence after that. And we'll have a nice special episode for you to post on July 4th. Uh, marketing gurus keep telling me that nobody listens to podcasts on holidays, but that's exactly when I listen to podcasts because I want to be distracted from whatever I'm being forced to do with whoever I'm having to hang out with on holidays. So we will be doing that for you, the lonely listeners who are like me out there, all three of you. So Rob, have a safe flight and uh, we'll catch up with you again in two weeks. Okay. Thanks, Jacob. And just don't forget the YouTube channel. Oh yes, we have a YouTube channel. Um, it's mostly just uh, the audio of these conversations, but we're talking about adding some video of us. If for some earthly reason you want to see the face that was fit for radio in the videos themselves, maybe some maps, maybe some charts. I don't know, but yes, check out our YouTube channel and follow us yeah. there if, if you want more content. It'll have our other videos on there as well. Um, oh, from our, some of the webinars, webinars we've done publicly. Yes. And so there's a bit of a grab bag of stuff. Yep. It's a, it's a Bagatelle podcast for a Bagatelle of content. Okay. Cheers, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.